friends, we need to talk about Christmas. Island. There are not as many Christmas islands in this world as I thought there'd be. Yes, there's a village named Christmas Island in Canada, but it's not an island and should not be counted. At best, there are two islands. One, located approximately 1,300 miles south of Honolulu and named by Captain Cook in 1777. And don't get it twisted, in the native Kiribati language, the T-I makes an S sound, so it's not pronounced uh, Kiritimati, but Christmas. The name stuck. Oh, this Christmas island is one of the first inhabited places on Earth to ring in the New Year, so... The other Christmas island is located about 220 miles south of Java in the Indian Ocean and about 960 miles northwest of Australia. The island was first sighted by Europeans in 1615, but wouldn't be named until Christmas Day, 1643, by Captain William Miners. And it wouldn't be inhabited until 1899, because I guess what's the point of taking over a tropical island if there's no native population to mess with? Am I right? I'm joking. The reason is a little more complicated than that. With no native population and sheer limestone cliffs, thick jungle, and no known safe anchorage for ships, exploring Christmas Island wasn't really on anyone's urgent to-do list. Until the Challenger Expedition. The Challenger Expedition was a scientific voyage which sailed from 1872 to 1876. Although they were processing and disseminating the data collected until about, oh, 1895. I think I need a new watch. You see, the nice thing about science is that even when the data collecting's done, the work has just begun. Now, John Murray was a Canadian who was brought on the crew to cover the oceanography and geological studies. The goal of the three and a half year voyage was to explore the bottom of the ocean floor and the physical condition and composition of the deep sea. The expedition even discovered what is now known as the Challenger Deep. It's the deepest known point in the Earth's seabed, located in the Mariana Trench near Guam. Yay, science! But the hardest part of science isn't always collecting the data. Sometimes it's getting the data processed. Once back on land, Murray took the reins on prodding the always procrastinating scientists to complete their assigned tasks. Oh, <laughs> the more things change. Now, Murray's assignment was to process rock samples that were collected from the various locations, and his own goal was to determine what coral reefs are even made of. What, you think we came into this world just knowing what coral reefs are made of? No! Some poor bastard had to go out there and figure it out. That's how it works. But John Murray didn't have as many samples as he hoped for. Oh, that's awkward. So he reaches out to one of his Navy buddies who was super jazzed about the idea of figuring out what coral reefs are made of. And that guy sends the request over to his dude, Captain J.F.L.P. McClear. Did your parents just really love monograms? Was your handkerchief all monogram? You can tell me, I won't tell anyone. Now, McClear had been commander of the Challenger expedition and had even spent some time on Christmas Island collecting samples by day, being overrun by the endemic rats by night. McClear even had the rat named in his honor. Oh, science. So glamorous. Anyway, McClear stopped at the island again in 1887 and finally found a good anchorage spot that would later be named Flying Fish Cove in honor of his ship, the HMS Flying Fish. Look at you, McClear, just having things named after you left and right. Now you're probably wondering, Nella, why was it so hard to find a place to anchor a ship in Christmas Island? Don't you just throw an anchor over the side and then you're good to go? Well, not to get into too many of the things to keep in mind when anchoring a ship, the problem with Christmas Island is that it's the peak of a mountain. The island was in fact the side of an enormous submarine mountain that when they let their lines down, even near land, there was no bottom so far as ordinary soundings were concerned, and that two miles away, the water had a depth of over 6,000 feet, or nearly one and a fifth mile. But even that was not the base of this huge mountain. To the north lay the awful sea valley known as McClear Deep, nearly four miles below the summit of Christmas Island, and to the south was that other valley, Wharton Deep, with a depth nearly as great. Should the water be suddenly swept from the Indian Ocean, Christmas Island would loom up from the sea bottom around it higher by far than any mountain known to man, and on all sides its peaks would be unscalably steep. And this, kids, is why I find the ocean to be horrifying. Anyway, McClear grabs more samples, and when Murray cracks into them back in his lab, 
he finds something. Something that's never been found before than a piece of coral, broken off from the reef. A pebble of pure phosphate of lime. This is a big deal. Phosphate is a chemical derivative of phosphoric acid, and while phosphoric acid can make your soda more acidic, in the 19th century it was vital to making fertilizer. Now, it just so happens that large portions of Christmas Island were covered in pure rock phosphate. Now, rock phosphate is formed when phosphoric acid is leached out of the guano covering the island surface and then replaces the lime in the coral limestone. According to the 1958 report from the Department of National Development Bureau of Mineral Resources, Geology, and Geophysics from the Commonwealth of Australia, let's see, where's the good part? Phosphate, uh, I know it's around here somewhere. Ah, aha, uh -huh. yes, the, um, the uh, coral limestone had covered the top of the island in prehistoric times, but that was back when Christmas Island was below the seawater. Uh, but then the area was lifted up due to volcanic activity, creating the island we know today. Nella, what's guano? Look, humans aren't going to crack synthetic nitrate until 1908, and even then, they aren't going to introduce it to the public in positive ways until a couple of wars and profit and weapons manufacture. So until then, humans need cheap fertilizer that's really going to give you that oomph your exhausted farmlands are looking for, and manure and sawdust just aren't cutting it. No, what you need is guano. Now, guano is bird and bat excrement, and it is loaded with nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, especially seabird guano. Say you have a cave full of bats or a convenient island that birds like to nest on. Now, no bird or bat is going around with a broom cleaning up after themselves, and well, all those droppings, they have nowhere to go, so they start piling up. Now, the word guano comes from the Incan word guanu. Incans were using the stuff from at least the 13th century. You know what, we're just gonna fast forward past all the super unfortunate Spanish colonialism. Now by 1839, Peru, where the Incan Empire had been, well, they're in trouble. You see, this was after their War of Independence and after the War of Confederation, and Peru needs money. Badly. Spanish colonial rule did not leave them with any manner of useful infrastructure or banking. But what should Peru find in this? Their greatest hour of need. Previously untapped guano islands right off their coast. I'm talking mountains of guano, 700 feet high, and Peruvian guano is considered of particular high quality because the arid nature of Peru means that those important nutrients aren't getting washed away in the rain, and the hot, dry climate also inhibits bacterial breakdown, making the guano viable for longer. Thus begins guano mania of the mid-19th century. You see, Europeans and Americans, we were getting nervous about how used up our farmlands were becoming. Guano was like steroids for agriculture and everybody wanted that sweet, sweet white gold. Oh, this is, um, <laughs> this is, this is not guano. This is a bath bomb I made at home to represent guano. Bath bombs, surprisingly easy to make at home. You just need sodium bicarbonate, citric acid, cornstarch, Epsom salts, oil, water. Oh, and this one has such a lovely beachy smell. Now, when you've got the good stuff, you start pushing your luck. The UK makes an exclusive deal with Peru, forcing the US to pass the Guano Island Act of 1856, which allowed any American citizen to claim any unclaimed and uninhabited guano island for the US, and is considered the US's first experiment in imperialism, even though we still had the balls to be like, oh, we're not claiming full ownership like those greedy British imperialists. No, we're just gonna collect all the guano and then abandon it when there's nothing left of use. Go team! But then, as time goes on, the Peruvian government starts increasing the cost of the guano. And even the UK is like, mm, you know, we really need cheaper bird droppings to stay competitive with the cheap US agricultural imports. This is bad news for Peru, who, by the 1860s, well, now you've got the Chink Island Wars because Spain's back and it's pissed and then Chile still is your land in the War of the Pacific and your and government your never managed those mines properly, properly anyway. anyway. And the indentured, and indentured workers, workers were treated, were treated terribly. terribly. And... <sighs> So, Christmas Island.
The British government moved pretty quickly on John Murray's discovery. They negotiated rights to the island and then brought over 1,800 Chinese, Malay, and Singaporean workers to begin mining for phosphate in 1899. Sir John Murray would credit the Challenger expedition for the creation of the highly profitable phosphate industry on Christmas Island. He wrote, his Majesty's Treasury has received from the Christmas Island phosphate industry and its owners in hard cash within the past 15 years, in the forms of rents, royalties, and taxes, a sum greater than the cost to the country of the whole Challenger expedition. Wow! It's almost like science, for the sake of science, can have unexpected economic windfalls or something. In 1949, the Australian and New Zealand governments would purchase the rights to the mining company, and in 1958, the island would become a territory of Australia. Now, mining continued until 1987, but then the Australian government shut down the mines, but then they were reopened in the 90s. Christmas Island has struggled with the economic necessity of the phosphate mines, and the endemic nature of the fauna and flora on the island, and the desire to preserve and protect those species. Many species have gone extinct, like McClure's rat and the Christmas Island shrew. The Christmas Island National Park, which makes up 64% of the island, was consolidated in 1989. The goal is to preserve the natural habitats of the remaining endemic species, many of which are endangered, like the Abbott's booby. Okay, okay, all right, take a moment, laugh it out. I get it, I too am five, it's fine. But in this instance, a booby is just a bird, you know, like the tit. And, um, and yeah, that's, um, that's about all I got about Christmas Island. Yep, I think, you know, I just, I can't shake the feeling like I'm missing something. You know what, I'm just gonna check my notes. No big deal. Uh, yeah, Christmas Island, discovered, um, yeah, yeah. Murray, phosphate, guano, rats. Murray. <gasps> I didn't miss it. There's still time. I am taking this video to its natural conclusion. And then I'm taking it a step too far. There are 20 species of crab on Christmas Island, but its most famous crab is the Genitalis. It's a terrestrial crab that's considered endemic to Christmas Island, but it can be found in small populations on the Cocos or Keeling Islands. Now, it's not the largest crab on Christmas Island. That honor goes to the coconut or robber crab, but it can grow to respectable sizes and can live up to 20 years. The total adult population is somewhere between 40 and 45 million, but that's not the most interesting thing about them. Now, during the dry season, the red crabs live in the rainforest in burrows with leaves plugging up the entrances to keep them from desiccating. But when the rainy seasons come, usually in November, it begins the March of the Red Crabs. Up to half of the red crab population will make the great migration from the jungle island plateau to the beach. So you've got millions of crabs trying to reach the few locations that don't end in a sheer drop to straight water. It's kind of like trying to get to the beach after work on a summer Friday. There is a backup. Now back before humans lived on Christmas Island, this wasn't so much of a problem. But now they've introduced these things called roads and cars which means humans are now coordinating road closures and the usage of these portable drift fences to direct migrating crabs towards tunnels that go under the road instead of over them. Okay, look, even if you're the kind of person who doesn't feel bad about running over thousands of crabs just trying to fulfill their biological imperative to mate, Cleanup has got to be awful, and the smell must be atrocious. Now, all of this can take place anytime between November and January, but only after the rainy season has begun and carefully timed to the final quarter phase of the moon, which I had to look up because I'm not a red crab, and in 2018, that falls on November 30th, December 30th, and January 28th. The best I can track on the official Christmas Island Instagram is that the migration officially began on November 11th. Now the males tend to arrive first about five to seven days after the journey begins, take a quick dip into the ocean and build burrows. Once the ladies show up though, the mating begins. 
The deed done, the dudes then head back to the jungle. The ladies stay behind in the burrows with their almost 100,000 eggs waiting for them to mature, which can take 12 to 13 days. Then, on the final quarter phase of the moon, if the weather is right, the ladies release their eggs into the ocean and make their own return trip back to the jungle. Now, if they're lucky and they haven't been eaten by manta rays or whale sharks in their entire month at sea, the tiny crab larvae will return to the shore, transform into tiny crabs, and then begin their own march to the jungle. They're just so small and cute. And then they rest for three years until they too can join the Great Migration. In America, the holiday season is pretty much from the beginning of November until January, just like the great migration of the Christmas Island red crabs. They're the perfect holiday season creature! Happy Crabmas, one and all! A shout out to my ear lenders, Chandra, William Christopher, and Zana Pink. I really appreciate your continued support at this level. And a special shout out to this cat. This annoying cat. I was only able to grab the one, not the other, but this is the boy cat and he makes small peeps. And a special thank you to AF Lindley. I didn't get to talk about our boy, Sturgis B. Rand, but your ability to find long forgotten white men is a Astounding. And if you, the viewer at home, have no idea what I'm talking about, she wrote about it on her Patreon page, so check out the link below. If you like my content here, I also have a podcast called the Apocalypse Book Club. My friend Raven and I are reading all apocalyptic fiction in chronological order starting in 1805. The 20th century is finally in our sights, so now is a great time to like and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or really anywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're listening to a podcast somewhere else, let me know. I'll try to get it up on there, too. I want to make this easy for you. Twas the island named Christmas, and all through the brush, all the red crowns were marching in their annual rush. The proteins in their langs were rearranged with care in hopes they would travel with time enough to spare. The season of rain had arrived as foretold, and the phase of the moon was just at the threshold, and males from the jungle with females close behind made it to the beach with just one thing in mind.